Right. So the first question, how did yes form? Cut. Yes formed actually before I joined, so the initial formation was about in 1969 while I was um, messing about in a four-piece group called Bodas. So by the time I got asked to join in 1970, the group did have a sort of reformation, if you like. I came in and we changed a few basic ideas about the group. We, didn't, we weren't going to use orchestras anymore. And after their, their second album, Time and a Word, had sort of orchestration on it. And uh, I think really, yes, formed uh, its new direction in 1970, partly helped by me, but partly also that there was just a change happening in the musical direction for the group. So it, it really reformed with the help of me, but really um, because the group needed a new direction. Can't. Is that a sort of answer? That's all right, isn't That's it? That's fine. That's okay. Great. I think the best songs that Yes recorded during my span with the group um, were mainly in, in its early period, if I can be so presumptuous. Um, I think that Close to the Edge overall, the 20 minute sort of mini epic, for me is one of the most satisfying things we did because it encompassed so much of what the group could do and actually did do on that one. Instead of uh, going off maybe into uh, tangents and, and musical doldrums occasionally, which we did start to do later in the 70s. This was uh, the epitome of yes. It was uh, very energetic. It had improvisation. It featured all the members of the band, and uh, it really did cover the ground. But also, I think, the same album, Siberian Katru, was also a personal favourite of mine, um, more in the live context when it was a vehicle to improvise on. Most probably the third one, last one, is still the same period. Uh, Roundabout was a song that in 1972 gave um, John Anderson and myself uh, quite a special award for a, one of the most popular songs of that year. And I think you know, that in itself was uh, a nice thing to, to get and it rewarded uh, John and I and the group for writing a song and arranging it in such a highly original fashion. Wonderful. Have you won any other awards for any of your music? Um, let me think. Yeah, well, John and I won um, Top Composer in Britain through the Melody Maker, and Yes always seemed to win Top Arrangers as well as the usual sort of you know, top bass, top guitar, top keyboard player. So really, Yes had quite a run at the, uh, the polls. And um, I think there may be a few other things uh, up in my uh, attic that I haven't looked at for about five years. <laughs> but uh, that's not to say that I'm not very pleased and proud of the, of the various uh, sorts of awards and albums, gold albums that I've got. But I find attempting to live with them is impossible. They have to be stored or shelved or something until some stage in my life when they have to come out again and I need reminding. Maybe it's a bit fresh in my mind. I don't need them hanging out to look at. Mm -hmm. Great. What are your fond memories of that band? Well, one of my humorous memories is that we were on the second tour and, of America and um, we arrived at a hotel and everybody checked in their rooms and I remember Bill opening his veranda window and saying, wow, a swimming pool. He sort of threw off his clothes and jumped in the pool. The only trouble was there wasn't any water in it. And uh, he cut his head and we had, you know, delay on the concert and would the drummer make the show? And he went on with this throbbing headache. Um, obviously, success is um, a, a very satisfying feeling. So I would cite also um, the Yes album when it got to number one in England was really exciting because it, it was the first you know, hit record really of any consequence that I'd had, and the group really, it really put Yes on the map. And likewise, the next year when we released um, Fragile and we came and toured, the timing was, was perfect and a manager's dream. And um, Fragile went to number two. So at that time also, I was uh, very, very pleased with that. So in a way, the high spots, um, once again, early on in the group, you know. Asia 
John Wetton and I got together on the idea that neither of us were uh, doing anything after um, his uh, career had given him the gap and yes, had um, disintegrated. So we, uh, we sat and talked about forming a group and we ended up uh, settling for a four-piece band. Originally we were thinking of a five-piece band, but it, it formed around John and myself's basic initial songwriting ideas like Without You, a um, couple of other songs, um, I think it was, uh, God, I've almost forgotten the songs. Oh, yeah, um, The Heat of the Moment, Heat of the Moment. We, we'd written a couple of songs like that, or got the bass ideas going, and then we, we looked uh, for a drummer initially, and uh, once we had uh, Carl Palmer um, in the hot seat on the drums, then Jeff Downs became more interested in our project and uh, came in and completed it. And then we spent all of 1981 uh, rehearsing. We did, I think, about three and a half months rehearsing and then recording. And we didn't actually finish the record until January 82. So um, the group took a long time to form, took a long time to uh, get run in. But uh, it um, sort of crashed into um, the running rather quickly. What songs do you feel show Asian? Well, I think Wildest Dreams is most probably the sort of song that was really all about the excitement and the energy of, of, of four experienced musicians getting together. And we could never quite seem to find that niche again. Uh, Wildest Dreams was, uh, was a song of John Wetton's. It had uh, some good basic ideas right from the word go, and also it, it had space for expansion as the group did arrange it. Uh, and develop some of the ideas, uh, move up the key at the end. Those sort of ideas are relatively easy but, um, to think of, but um, a little bit harder to put actually into action. And we, I think Wildest Dreams is one of the most exciting Asia things uh, as far as I'm concerned. Great. What are your fond memories of Asia? Do you have any diving into swimming pool memories? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me think. Well, I, I was going to cite the, the predictable, you know, the, the immense and the immediate success of the group was obviously very uh, gratifying and very exciting because it opened up many possibilities. Um, doing the videos was quite fun with Godly and Cream, the first two on the album. Um, in a way, the group... Uh, we weren't quite so loony as Yes were in the early days. Um, I suppose we were individually. We all had our uh, idiosyncrasies, but in a way there wasn't a collective um, scattiness or, or, or looniness. There was, I think everybody got, got loony on their own, you know. Um, so the overall, uh, my greatest memories of Asia must be really just that it, it, was, it was so quick to peak and um, it was so hard to follow. And uh, I would confess that the second album was a, a real um, slow, difficult process. And it was musically and technically unsatisfactory when it was finished. So really, Asia was all, was all about 1982. Uh, we had a fantastic year. We, everything we did in 82 worked. We went to Europe, we played in Wembley. Uh, and we toured America for, I think, 10 weeks. So um, we, we had definitely had some immense highs and a few serious lows, you know, just to bring us back into reality because a group that took off that quick um, maybe was, was destined to fall quite quickly as well, which I think, um, well, I'll leave that to the future because the group's still going without me and I mustn't uh, be too condescending. My musical influences really must be in about three categories. I mean, initially, when I started playing the guitar, there, were, um, there was a whole new thing happening with uh, you know, Elvis and the Every Brothers, and they had Chet Atkins playing guitar for a while. Um, there were um, instrumental groups, unlike you know, 
there are today, like Dwayne Eddy and the Rebel Rousers and all that. In a way, that was the initial um, kickoff for me. There, there was a, a certain guitar mania, and um, definitely Chet Atkins always has always intrigued me uh, because he, he's very hard to pinpoint really what he is. He's a he's a very versatile guitarist, maybe not a very fashionable guitarist, but then come the mid-60s, there was you know, a big change and everybody wanted to write their own songs and uh, the group I was in started doing that. We changed our name overnight. We almost changed our coat, if you like. We just changed everything about the group from one week to another and we became a group called Tomorrow, influenced you know, by the birds, by uh, the Beatles, by... Um, it was a group phase when everything was a group. Uh, um, and I, I liked the big three. I thought the big three were a bloody great British group who, who made only about two or three records ever, but they were all very energetic. Um, similar to, you know, out of the Beatles sort of clone, but they were much rougher and rawer. And I tend to think that that's when the guitar hero started to appear. Um, Brian Griffiths, guitarist, who consequently disappeared or doing a, a milk round or something, uh, had all the embryonic stages of Guitar Hero. You know, he, he was very talented. Uh, he had an original sort of approach, a bit like the kink sort of... Dun, 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 dun. You know, he had that all going very, very early on. Power stuff. Um, but then once the, the 70s came in, uh, I started to sort of mature, I suppose. I started listening to all sorts of music, you know, from Hungary to Brazil, you know, Vila Lobos, classical music ancient music. Uh, I, got, I met people like John Williams and Julian Bream. I met people that I admired tremendously, um, like Les Paul. And, and um, I suppose really that, that, that third stage was really much more about actual strong musical influences and, and, than really popular trends. So I started to find my own um, satisfaction out of listening to obscure things, things like hurdy-gurdy music, you know, it's an instrument you, you turn a handle on and press buttons. I've got one actually, I've occasionally played it in studios, usually it has a very comic reaction, people just fall on the floor laughing that I'm doing this, but those sort of instruments um, actually give me a sort of uh, new viewpoint on the guitar, you know, I can go back and imitate or, or, or uh, get inspiration from things that normally uh, people would um, think uh, are inspiration maybe for a different sector of people. So um, sometimes I look back at, at guitarists like Big Bill Brunsey, blues players. Uh, really a lot of American musicians have inspired me tremendously. I'm not just saying that because I'm on MTV, but that was my initial thing. But then I realised in the 70s there was a much bigger, bigger place than that. And, um, going to Japan last year, connected again with MTV, I found it much more um, of a cultural place to get into. Uh, before when I went there, I just starved for three weeks because I couldn't eat any of the food because I don't like raw fish. And uh, so really, I suppose, as you mature a little, you can find more things to interest you, sometimes in the same area. And, uh, I certainly now, I, go to, I went to see Segovia about three weeks ago, he played in, in England, and people like that are always going to have some effect on me because you can't play, you, nobody can play the guitar like he does. And uh, that's a very important function of, of an instrument that you can be yourself on. I find with, you know, with a drum machine or a program synthesizer, you're, you're merely manipulating technology, you're not really um, releasing uh, some sort of alpha rhythms or, 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 or something that sort of transcends the grooves in the record. Um, but I like those things that inspire me from within, as opposed just to, oh, I get knocked out, I get a new gadget and you can press this and that. It's great, but it's short-lived, it's a toy. And uh, I think, um, well, I still look for the more earthbound sort of things. Uh, sometimes uh, rustic or uh, sometimes antiquated. I, I like old instruments. I like the way they allow personality to dominate them and, and use them. What uh, musicians have you played with and admired? 
Well, working backwards, last year I played with um, Steve Morse. Uh, he's a guitarist who's had a uh, uh, peculiar kind of success. I mean, he, he's done the uh, Guitar Player Awards, you know, three years top guitarist, and I think he's a very happy musician. I hope you're all right, Steve. Um, he's a brilliant musician in as far as um, he the mixture, I suppose, of so many, you know, from Jeff Beck to, to a bit of me to, to a wider range of guitarists who, fresher, newer range of guitarists who uh, are finding their place. But I, I was very shocked to find that everybody in the States wasn't buying Dixie Dreg records. You know, I was horrified when I came and realized these records weren't a huge success. They hadn't sold millions. Because over here, when I got them, I thought, well, that, that's obviously a million seller record. I mean, they all must be. Because they were so ingeniously constructed. Maybe highly technical. But anyway, Steve Morse, I played with him last year at this club in New York called My Father's Place. I had a great time. Uh, Several years before, I played with Les Paul in, in England. Um, that was also very exciting. He, he threw me totally. He'd been playing 12 bars for about, you know, 12 bar sequences for about half an hour. And then it was sort of, yeah, come up, you know, come up, Steve. And he just threw one on me. Do you know <laughs> this song? You know, never heard it in my life before. So I had to bluff my way around. And when you have to bluff your way around with a guitarist as important as Les Paul after he... He developed multi-recording, he, he really hooked Echo to the electric guitar and made, gave it a dimension that it's always relied on. And, um, and I, of course, wanted to uh, impress him, and I had to really bluff, so Les, I was bluffing like mad because I didn't know what the hell, what the chord sequences were. So um, I've met people who, like Chet Atkins, I mean, I'm talking about guitarists, really, because um, I'm more interested in guitarists. But of course, I've met also, um, you know, at different times, singers who've been important to me. But uh, I've also missed opportunities. Like, I mean, I was a big Bob Dylan fan, and I still am. I particularly like the last album he did with Mark Knopfler. So, but I wouldn't have known what to say to him. Only, well, do you need a guitarist, you know, on your next record? But uh, I think your impression of, of, of people um, usually increases when you meet them, and uh, it, it deepens. And therefore, the few um, people like that that I've met in the guitar world, uh, I've usually gone back and, and had a good chance to rethink my impressions of them. Like when I met Les Paul, for instance, I discovered that he, he'd got a fixed an arm, he'd hurt in, his, in, a, in a car accident, and he really, really liked humorous people. You know, he didn't like boring musicians, you know, people who were long-faced and serious, you know. And when I went back and listened to Les Paul's records, I could then see that all this joy in them was, was a lot to do with this, you know, awareness of humour and, and not taking yourself too, too seriously. Can you describe your perception of the rock music scene in England in the late 60s, early 70s? I should be able to describe the, the 60s, 70s period, because I suppose I was, you know, I was quite a part of it, but um, the, the, the 60s to me were, um, were really a very naive sort of time, and we were, you know, the music scene, there were, there were sh the sort of shows, the sort of sound people were getting on stage was really dreadful. I mean, there was no other excuse for it. There was no proper PA systems until, uh, 1970, in fact, when Yes bought one from the group Iron Butterfly. They brought one over and we had to go through hell with the customs men to buy this PA. Sound, the sound was restrictive uh, until the 70s, but the, um, I think the excitement was enough to inspire quite a few Americans on, to get on the tracks. I mean, I'm not really, I'm talking after the, after the Beatles had become accepted. England carried on uh, making progress and uh, being progressive and also when flower power psychedelia was happening I suppose it was happening in, in America first it seemed like here uh, we, we, we came up with our own kind of music and the Floyd tomorrow um, the bands that came out like you know Stevie 
Winwood, with Traffic and all those bands, we were really offering a um, very quirky original style of music. I think then the 70s brought the, uh, I, don't, I wasn't going to say super group, but more the, um, the technical sort of side out. And, and I think uh, English musicians had always felt that American musicians were very, very talented and technically very efficient. But somehow I think that England surged on a bit more there and out of it came the sort of thinking man's rock groups, you know, like Yes, ELP, Genesis, blah, 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 you know, quote, quote, quote. But, um, and out of that, I suppose, was, was the headache of, of how do you keep going, you know, and then we started being called the techno rock bands, and there were some really awful things that really we laughed at, quite honestly, when we used to buy the NME and it sort of said, you know, one of the worst records Yes ever made has got to be Tomato. Well, I sort of agree, but it went on and totally ripped the group apart, you know. And in a way, we were, we were li leading ourselves open to that by the sort of music and the complexity and the sort of airy fairiness of what we were doing. So, but of course, out of that, America started breeding, you know, the Bruce Springsteens and the, you know, a lot of very substantial artists who are still making records now and still selling really well at concerts, you know, and, and, you, and I think what it proved overall, that sort of time span, is that it doesn't matter how many hit records you have, if you can't get out and, and play really well on stage, then, you know, you're bluffing a bit. And uh, I think that that maybe is what England's going through a little bit with some of its sort of young bands who make very good records, but they still haven't had the experience of performing in, in the big context, you know, of the 10,000, 15,000 seater. I mean, I'm not knocking them, money saying, well, they've got to gather that experience before they can really make it really come off. But, I mean, the people who have already had that experience, like Billy Joel, say, can walk on the stage and get the whole place, you know, 20,000, 30,000 people going, you know. But I think you put a, um, I don't know how, I know Duran Duran are doing very, very well, but they're still quite a young band to, to get all the charisma together and, uh, and all, you know, the sound, the staging, the music, the, the order of the show, personalities, all this going. I mean, it's quite a tall order. And um, it was certainly a, a, an interesting challenge that groups, in the quotes that I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, actually pulled it off. I and mean, we were quite naive still. Uh, when, when, when I went there in 1971, we got, I, the first show I did was in front of 15,000 people. Now really, up until then, I'd only played really clubs and what we call town halls, and then maybe the concert hall circuit, like, uh, you know, in, in Amsterdam and, and Germany, and quite big places. But um, suddenly it was on stage at Edmonton, Ontario. I, no, Ed, oh, Edmonton's not in Ontario, is it? Well, sorry, Canada, oh, but... Somewhere near. Edmonton, Canada, um, playing with Jethro Tull, and it, it really was exciting. I mean, it was almost electrifying to be suddenly responsible for entertaining so many people at one time. That was, uh, I think, what I learned out of the 60s and 70s. I hope I learned it reasonably well. I don't forget it. Just how to come on and, and give them a good show. This show is about the progressive rock scene, highlighting bands such as Traffic, Jethro Tull, Genesis, ELP, Yes, King Crimson. Any comments on any of these bands? Then none of them are in the charts at the moment. <laughs> What's the idea? No, well, all those, but the bands that we've been talking about um, all relied partly on good production. Otherwise, the complexity of the music would never have got through. And sometimes it was a real battle to get the, you know, the bass part plus the keyboard and guitar. And now, of course, production's taken even more of a forefront in that a lot of records are just very well produced, very simple musical ideas. And what we were trying to do was have very highly complex ideas well produced. And um, it's definitely easier to have a highly produced simple idea than a well produced complex idea. I think um, the bands that I 
felt excited about. I was always excited about ELP, but really, without this sounding like a put down, because it really isn't. Initially, and most probably, mostly because of Keith Emerson, because um, he, um, he had a feel about him that, that gave him a lot of presence, you know, to me. And I like that style. I think I like Genesis a lot when they, um, just before Peter Gabriel left, and, and, and then when Phil suddenly found the voice, you know, and, and I think Steve Hackett encouraged him quite a lot to, to uh, come out of his shell, you know, and sing. Um, hang on, is this question, what do I think of them? What or, do you think? God, what do I think about them? Well, these progressive rock bands of the early 70s, they, I had, didn't have much, enough ch chance then to really decide what I thought about them because, in fact, they were in competition. And when you're in competition with people, you have a s rather tainted view of them. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a downer view. It's only that uh, there's elements of competition and their strengths um, you tend to weigh up against, i.e., yes, I was in. And uh, yes were, had an inner ego, egotism that was rather useful because we felt that yes had it all covered. You know, we had great vocal harmonies, a great guitarist, great keyboard. We were always seeking to keep the standard of each unit and, and, uh, and each uh, area covered and as soon as we didn't you know as soon as like Bill left then we had to get you know a great drummer in so really I, I remember it more as a semi-competitive musical array where it was like uh, not keeping up with the Joneses but keeping ahead of the other groups that were coming up behind you because when we went to America ELP were headlining and we used to support them but the, uh, the guys used to be at the side of the stage with long faces, you know, yes, we're trying to do another encore, you know. There was this, you know, we were always trying to keep ahead, even sometimes when we were behind, we were always trying to keep ahead. Um, I think it wasn't really until 1980 when there was a sort of a, a lull in, for me when yes uh, split. I could look back and maybe start to enjoy more some of the other things that, they, that the groups were doing. Um, but I think Jethro Tull was a little bit of a mixture of the of 60s, 70s, because when we went, they were, they were already huge, and yes, were totally unknown. They did perpetuate. Some of them had very long careers, which, which uh, is quite surprising. And i.e. Jethro Tull, I believe, has just crept in the you know, American Top 100 again. I mean, that, that is a very long career. So um, those groups must have secretly inspired me all the time because, other, you know, it was fuel. You know, listen to, you know, hear the new Genesis record and, mm, well, they've damn good, they've got good songs, but guitarist isn't quite as good, you know. There was, you know, when Steve Hackett left, there was a sort of guitar gap in the group, really. And um, although Mike Rutherford was doing all the guitar stuff very well, it wasn't a la yes, it's sort of always trying to be the virtuosos, you know which sometimes we weren't, but we were always trying to be. Um, that's it, I can't say any more. Do you want to just check, actually, do we cut the... Mm.